All right, so welcome everyone. I have the pleasure today of welcoming you to the first session of the Viral Hepatitis Prevention and Surveillance Virtual Learning Collaborative, also known as the VLC, uh, which is a collaboration between NASAD and CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis. My name is Watima Terry reed and I'm the Director of Hepatitis at NASAD. Before I hand things off, I just want to give many thanks to NASDAQ, CDC, and our health department colleagues who have worked uh, extremely hard to bring the VLC to fruition, as well as today's session. I also want to say a special thank you to Isabel Lechuga, as well as Kathleen Lee, uh, for their leadership in the planning and preparation of today's session. With that, I will now prepare to turn it over to today's moderator, uh, Kathleen Lee, who is an epidemiologist in the Epidemiology and Surveillance Branch at DVH and editor of the Viral Hepatitis Surveillance and Case Management Guidance for State, Territorial, and Local Health Department, which will be the main focus of today's session. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Kathleen. All right, thank you, Batma, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our first surveillance session um, entitled Surveillance Guidance Overview with the Workgroup Leads. Um, so this session, it will provide an overview of the seven hepatitis condition-specific sections of DVH's recently published Viral Hepatitis Surveillance and Case Management Guidance, and will demonstrate application of surveillance through case scenarios as presented by six of our hepatitis condition specific workgroup leaders. The session will also provide a space for jurisdictions to seek technical guidance from our workgroup leaders, other jurisdictional colleagues in the audience and CDC, um, as well as provide an opportunity for jurisdictions who are in the beginning stages of developing their surveillance program to learn best practices from jurisdictions who are further along with their surveillance work. Joining us today as our presenters are the subject matter experts who led the development of the condition specific content in the guidance document. Um, in order of presentation, we are joined by Brandy Taylor, who is the hepatitis A workgroup lead and who is the hepatitis A outbreak epidemiologist at the Ohio Department of Health. Kristen Sweet, who is the chronic hepatitis B workgroup lead and who is the viral hepatitis manager at the Minnesota Department of Health. Kristen will also be covering the acute hepatitis B surveillance content on behalf of Jill Denise Scalar, who could not be here today. Kelly Gillespie, who is the perinatal hepatitis B and hepatitis B during pregnancy workgroup leader, and who is the hepatitis B epidemiologist at the Philadelphia Department of Health. Bree Barbo, who is the acute hepatitis C workgroup lead and who is the viral hepatitis manager at the Utah Department of Health. Lindsay Sizemore, who is the chronic hepatitis C workgroup leader and who is the viral hepatitis program director at the Tennessee Department of Health. And last but not least, Danica Cuzio, who is the perinatal hepatitis C and hepatitis C during pregnancy workgroup leader and who is the viral hepatitis program manager at the Philadelphia Department of Health. The full bios of our presenters will be added in the description in the recording so that you can read more about our work group leaders. Um, in terms of session format, we will start with 10 minute presentations and case scenarios from each of the six work group leaders, followed by approximately 30 minutes for Q&A and open discussion with session participants. Um, to stay on time, a bell will sound by Isabel when there is one minute remaining. Um, we will hold questions until the Q&A session at the end, but you may feel free to use the chat box to enter your questions at any time. Um, Isabel and I are both monitoring the chat box and will ensure that your questions will be addressed. So now I will turn it over to our first presenter, Brandy Taylor, to kick us off. Brandy, um, over to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today. Very much appreciate your time. I tend to talk a lot, so I'm really on a schedule today to shorten this to 10 minutes, so please feel free to reach out to me. I've included my contact information at the end afterwards if you'd like to talk about specific scenarios. Can you see my slides okay? Beautiful. Great, thank you. So I am the epidemiologist in charge of hepatitis A investigation for the Ohio Department of Health. Hepatitis A is a little bit different than the other hepatitis that we're going to be talking about today. 
Hepatitis A is, of course, an acute liver disease caused by a coronavirus, but this one is usually spread by fecal oral means rather than uh, bloodborne primarily. It has an incubation period of 15 to 50 days. There, is a vac well, there are several vaccines licensed for hepatitis A, licensed in 1995 and 1996. And in 2006, ACIP added them to the universal childhood vaccination schedule. Um, hepatitis A is um, primarily about vaccination as a means of prevention and then also of control. So there is a vaccine available to the children and those prior to contact, but also to those who may have come in contact with somebody who has the disease who's previously unvaccinated. And contacts who've recently been exposed to somebody with hepatitis A who've not previously received the vaccine should be administered a single dose of a single antigen vaccine or immunoglobulin as soon as possible within two weeks after the exposure. Hepatitis A has been uh, the subject of an ongoing multi-state outbreak investigation. It began in 2016. There are over 30 states that have been impacted by this outbreak. This outbreak is primarily among people who use drugs, people who are experiencing homelessness, and um, men who are having sex with men. In Ohio, we also look at categories who've been incarcerated, those with other liver diseases. This is primarily spread, it's a person-to-person -person outbreak among primarily those groups of people. And it has been ongoing since 2016 in many states. The case definition for hepatitis A, uh, hepatitis A is an acute disease. There is not a chronic form. So we're looking at a positive IgM anti-HAV or NAT, not a total antibody result uh, for a laboratory result that comes to us that would help us trigger an investigation into a hepatitis A case. It requires a discrete onset of acute symptoms and then evidence of liver dysfunction. As I said, this is a liver disease primarily, as you're well aware. So that would be evidenced by jaundice or peak elevated bilirubin levels above three or peak elevated ALT enzymes greater than 200. Uh, a piece that sometimes gets lost in this is that it also requires the absence of a more likely diagnosis. Uh, hepatitis A symptoms, can also be symptoms of other illnesses, both acute and chronic as well. IgM testing should not be conducted on asymptomatic individuals. That often is an issue that we run into, but that is why uh, the IgM test is the gold standard because we're looking at people who already are symptomatic. The case ascertainment chart for hepatitis A uh, looks complicated. In general, what we're getting, at least when I'm looking at cases with the Ohio Department of Health, we're starting with a lab result. So we're getting a lab result from a lab provider or from a hospital. And then what we're looking at, if, if the test is an IgM or an RNA test, and we're looking at a positive RNA test, then we're looking at a confirmed hepatitis A case, which should then trigger case follow-up and investigation. If we're looking at a positive IgM test, not an RNA, then we look at the second part, the clinical criteria. Does the case have the symptoms consistent with acute viral hepatitis A and jaundice or total bilirubin above 300 or ALT greater than 200, like we just discussed? to meet the case definition. If we don't know that there is, um, uh, that these symptoms are consistent or don't have the evidence of liver involvement, then we would not be able to classify this as an acute case of hepatitis A. And I know this is complex. We'll be going through a few scenarios in a moment that will hopefully make it a little clearer and solidify it for you. If we received a lab report and it's a positive IgM and we do have symptoms consistent and we do have evidence of liver involvement, then we would look at, is there a more likely diagnosis, which as I mentioned is sometimes uh, skipped or not thought of. 
if there is not a more likely diagnosis, then we would confirm the Hep A case. And then again, that would trigger case follow up and investigation. To look at the lab report that's a positive IgM. And then we do have, um, we, um, I'm sorry, my apologies. To look at a lab report, but both the IgM and the RNA are negative in the lab report, then we're not looking at a case. We need to have either a positive IgM or a positive RNA to have a confirmed case of hepatitis A. Again, it looks complex, but when you're working through the scenarios, it helps solidify it for you. So let's discuss a couple scenarios that I encounter regularly when I am classifying cases of hepatitis A. So if we are looking at patient one who has abdominal pain and dark urine, which are absolutely symptoms associated with acute hepatitis A, and then we have a positive hepatitis A IgM that was collected right around the time of symptom onset. And we have an ALT that's 360 and we don't have another likely diagnosis. This is a case that we would consider a confirmed case of hepatitis A. We've got the laboratory information with the positive IgM that's required. We've got the symptoms and we've got evidence of liver involvement and we don't have any other likely diagnosis. This one is the easiest to classify for me. It's fairly straightforward. Looking at patient two, we have serum collected and a positive hepatitis A IgM. We've got abdominal pain and dark urine, so we have associated symptoms. And we have an ALT of 570, which certainly is greater than 200. However, on this patient, we also have a physician diagnosis of acetaminophen toxicity. So this person uh, came in and they had perhaps taken too much Tylenol. In this instance, while we do have a positive IgM and we do have the associated symptoms and we do have evidence of liver involvement with the high LT, we also have a more likely diagnosis of acetaminophen toxicity. In this instance, I would not count this as a confirmed case of acute hepatitis A. For patient three, we've got abdominal pain and white chalky stool, which are symptoms of hepatitis A. We have serum collected, which is positive for total HAV, but no IgM was conducted. We have a bilirubin of 4.0, and we have no other likely diagnosis. So in this instance, we do not have a positive IgM, and we do not have a positive RNA. So without one of those laboratory pieces of evidence, we don't have enough information to say whether this is a confirmed case or not. Despite the fact that there are symptoms associated, there is evidence of liver involvement because of the bilirubin level, um, and because there's no other likely diagnosis, if we had a positive IgM, we would count this. In Ohio, if I'm speaking with a local health department, we are decentralized here, so they do the immediate case investigation. I'm speaking with a local health department who has a big resources. I would probably ask them to contact the physician to determine if an IgM was going to be conducted and to suggest that it is if the person has a picture that looks as though it could be acute hepatitis A, which I think we're looking at here with this constellation of information. Patient four, nausea and abdominal pain, positive total HAV, but negative IgM. We don't have any liver enzyme or bilirubin results, but we also don't have another likely diagnosis. So what we're dealing with in this instance is a negative IgM. Despite the fact there is a positive HAV, we again don't have that laboratory evidence that's needed. We also do not have in this instance any information of liver involvement. We do have some yeah. symptoms that are kind of general, but we don't have enough information in this instance 
to classify this case as an acute case of hepatitis A. I had an excellent, excellent group of people that worked with me to develop the chapter of guidance for hepatitis A. Very much want to thank Bernadette and Saul and Bree and Cassie and Julia and Sarah and Robert and Suda. Without the experiences of the variety of health departments, we would not have had such a great complete picture of the guidance. We had some very robust discussions about these types of scenarios, and I'm very, very grateful for their input. And certainly their work has made this guidance incredibly useful, and I hope you find it as such. As I said, my contact information is here. Please, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. I have been pulled strongly into COVID, as I'm sure many of you have, but I'm always happy to try to assist you as I can. I remember steep learning curve that comes with classifying hepatitis A cases and then providing case management guidance afterwards. And I'm happy to help however I can. And that is all I have. Thank you so much for your time. Hi everyone. Um, I'm just getting my screen up and running here for everyone. And I think I tested this and I think it works. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Sweet and I work in um, at the Minnesota Department of Health in viral hepatitis. Um, I'm gonna be going very quickly today. Uh, I am also love talking about hepatitis, especially hepatitis B. I think that it's really tricky and fun, um, but I'm gonna go pretty quick today. So. Um, there's going to be some slides where when you look at this afterwards, I encourage people to go, especially through the case scenarios and take some time to review them later because we won't have time to do them um, in, in full and justice today, but I hope they'll give you some examples and I tried to make it so you could work through the slides on your own as well. Um, so really quick acute hepatitis B overview. Um, transmission is generally bloodborne or sexual transmission or vertical transmission from mother to child at birth. Um, the Signs and symptoms of hepatitis B are indistinguishable from other forms of acute hepatitis. Um, unfortunately, asymptomatic infection is common and adults and older children are more likely to have symptoms than, than very young children. Um, and the reason that we have the case criteria for hep B, I think this is important to think about what you're trying to do with it, um, is to differentiate it from other forms of acute hepatitis, viral and otherwise, um, and to differentiate from chronic hepatitis B. And luckily I'm presenting both today, so I will get an opportunity to talk to both of those. Um, the negative outcomes that we're worried about with acute hepatitis B is chronic infection, which varies depending on the age of infection, um, fulminant hepatitis, liver transplant, and death, uh, rare but can occur. Um, prevention for hepatitis B, vaccine is available for hepatitis B. I don't have all the details here, but um, hopefully you'll have that available in several ways to you. Um, standard precautions during things like medical procedures um, and other settings where uh, bodily fluids are, are present and use of condoms during sexual activity. Um, here's the case definition for hepatitis B. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. This is in the surveillance guidelines, which I believe were linked in the in the chat earlier. Um, so feel free to take a look at that. Uh, I would say hepatitis B case definitions are always um, challenging, and I always have to refer to them um, when we have a particularly interesting case to make sure that I'm using them correctly. So for those of you who are just starting out, do not worry if you're looking at case definitions, um, especially for hepatitis B. And actually, I realize, I'm sorry, this is covering part of my slides, isn't it? I really apologize. There we go. Um, hopefully that's better for people and my apologies. I can't see the comments um, at the same time as this, so my apologies. So I'm gonna work through a couple of cases. Um, so in this case, uh, as, as uh, the previous speaker said, the most common way we get things reported is a lab result, but occasionally we do get these phone calls. Um, so in this case, a provider calls and says they have a 57 year old male presenting with a seven day history of headache, nausea, and one day of yellow eyes. Um, the person was born in the United States, has had six sexual partners in the last six months, two male and four female occasionally uses marijuana, consumes three to five drinks daily, um, and has a history of hepatitis vaccine before his trip to Mexico last year. This provider is absolutely sure that this is acute hepatitis B because of, he just knows, um, even though um, we know that the clinical symptoms um, do not necessarily speak to that. And, and there's several things in here that, that might make that more or less likely. Oops. No, there we go. Uh, so questions you think through at this point, do we have enough information to classify this person as a case of, a case of acute hepatitis B? I'd love to have this as a back and forth right now, but just think about this um, in your head or discuss it if you have other people there or think about it afterwards. If not, what additional information do we need on this case to assess them for viral hepatitis? Um, and what risk factors that you reported are known to be associated with hepatitis B? 
So now we get uh, some lab testing. The provider actually does gets the lab testing back, and we see that the person has um, several hepatitis tests that are positive. The total anti um, antibody for hepatitis A is positive. The IgM for hepatitis B is positive. And sorry, that was an auto um, uh, capitalization. Surface antigen positive. DNA is positive. Um, and then there's several negative tests as well. The um, IgM for hepatitis A is negative. The surface antibody for hepatitis B is negative, and the hepatitis C antibody is negative. Um, and we see the elevation in the ALT, AST, and that that total billy um, has is elevated as well. Um, so now another question, do we now have enough information to classify this person as a case of acute hepatitis B? And if not, what additional information do we need um, to assess him for viral hepatitis? Uh, and thinking about this, thinking about this, what are the key factors that indicate this person has acute hepatitis B and not chronic hepatitis B? Um, and if you can classify this case now, what key factors indicate this person has acute hepatitis B and not a fact, um, another type of acute viral hepatitis? Um, and again, I'm sorry, I can hear the chats coming in, but I can't have them up on the screen or you won't be able to see my slides. So my apologies for that. I'll answer questions during the Q&A. Um, one additional piece of information we get um, is that the provider diagnoses this person with acute hepatitis B based on the test results and the clinical assessment. Uh, the patient is counseled on his alcohol use and liver health. I thought I'd throw that in there because that's always a good thing. So these are the same questions as before. I won't go through them again, but just thinking about, do we know enough? What other information might we need? And what helps us tease out if it's acute versus chronic, or if we think it's acute, what helps us know that it's B versus A or C? Um, so really quickly, so uh, if the HEP-A uh, for, protocol was challenging, I'll be honest and say HEP-B has an, an added dimension to it, um, but we'll say here we have this provider report of hepatitis B infection in a person over 24 months of age, um, he's 57, is the person an existing chronic event and he's not, um, is he newly reported, and the answer is yes, um, he is positive for surface antigen and DNA, so we follow the yes here. Did the, I, hopefully you can all see my mouse. Um, did the patient have a documented negative surface antigen test result um, within six months? Uh, and the answer is no, um, we don't have any evidence of past testing. Um, does the patient have symptoms consistent with uh, acute viral hepatitis? And the answer is yes, and jaundice or elevation of the ALT. And uh, both of those are true. So yes, is there a more likely diagnosis in this case? The provider has not found a more likely diagnosis. We have no indication of it. So this is a confirmed acute hepatitis B case. Um, on the next slide, you can see how this person meets the case definition. So they're over 24 months. Uh, discrete onset of symptoms is true here. Jaundice was true. ALT was elevated, yes. So the, one of those had to be true. In this case, both were. Um, in the lab, at least one of these two must be true. The IgM was positive or the surface antigen was positive. In this case, both are true. Um, and if done, the IgM needs to be negative. And in this case, because I made this case a slam dunk, uh, all of these things are true. And this person very clearly meets the case definition. I'll take a very quick look here at the chat and just make sure I'm realizing. Okay, good. Nothing that I need to be aware of as I go here. Um, so the next uh, slide, we have case two. Now this one's my, my trickier uh, case. Um, so this is a 23 year old female presenting with a history of headache, nausea and fatigue for the past three to four weeks. She's five months pregnant and this is her first prenatal visit. Her surface antigen comes up positive on her prenatal screening. She was born in the United States, has one male sexual partner for the last three years, has a history of opioid use in her teens, but denies current use and denies ever injecting. She's unsure of her vaccine history, but thinks she got all of her vaccines as a child, no knowledge of um, vaccine hesitancy. And as a 23 year old, I'm using Minnesota cases, um, we would expect a 23 year old would have received hepatitis B vaccine if she had um, been appropriately vaccinated as a child. Here are lab results for this person. So we're seeing that um, they did more of a chronic panel or a general hepatitis B panel on this person, um, a hepatitis panel. Um, and we see that she uh, is positive for hepatitis A total antibody, surface antigen positive, surface antibody negative, hepatitis B DNA was detected, um, hepatitis C antibody was negative. The ALT is above that 100, um, AST is mildly elevated and her bilirubin is in the range of normal. So again, um, what do we have enough information? If not, what else do we need? And is this a case of public health significance? Um, so additional information, she found her immunization records from childhood, and it turns out she started her vaccination for hepatitis B starting at age one, but only received one dose. 
This is her first pregnancy. She's never been tested for hepatitis B previously, and her provider diagnoses acute hepatitis B based on the test results and his clinical assessment. Um, so again, questions. Do we now have enough information? I won't go through all of them here. I'm sorry, because I have limited time. So in this case, it's a little more complicated. Again, she is over 24 months. Uh, she did have a discrete onset of headache, nausea, and fatigue. Uh, jaundice was not reported, but her ALT was over 100. So she does have one of those two criteria. Um, and then she did have um, an IgM was not done, but she is surface antigen positive. And her, uh, so one of those is true. And her hepatitis A IgM was negative. I'm sorry, I left that out of, oh, it was not done. Sorry, it was not done. So she meets the criteria. Phew, have to read my own uh, scenarios better here. So that is the, the second one. So we do have enough information and we have figured it out. And the um, question about, I'm sorry, this slide should have been in that spot. Question about public health significance is, um, yes, this would be a case of public health significance because um, this is a pregnant woman with hepatitis B. Um, and so it'd be appropriate to also refer her um, onto a perinatal hepatitis B prevention program as well. Um, she has been diagnosed later in pregnancy. So it'd be uh, very important for her to um, be processed through there, potentially have some additional hepatitis B DNA testing as well. Um, so that was our whirlwind through acute hepatitis B, and I'm going to be even faster through chronic hepatitis B and only do one of my examples. But again, please do uh, feel free to refer to these slides after the presentation and work through these. And if you have questions when you're working through the examples, um, I'm, I'm happy to assist. So for chronic hepatitis B, uh, very similar because acute hepatitis B leads to chronic hepatitis B. You can't get chronic hepatitis B without becoming infected, whether or not you have symptoms um, varies, but you will have to get the infection to have chronic hepatitis B. The outcomes we're worried about with um, hepatitis B are cirrhosis, liver cancer with or without cirrhosis, and death. Um, the goals of the case criteria here are distinguished from other forms of chronic hepatitis, identify possible acute hepatitis B, and confirm infection for perinatal hepatitis B prevention. Um, and prevention is really through preventing those acute infections uh, with the methods I described earlier. There's several pieces. Um, many people might be taking on chronic hepatitis B surveillance for the first time. Uh, several components to that, uh, what we recommend for a core surveillance program. So the first is really getting at case um, ascertainment and reporting, which involves creating and maintaining an electronic system for collecting and storing lab and case data. Um, that data has to get to somewhere. So coming up with a method to receive those data, ideally through an electronic lab system that could automatically enter the records into the surveillance system. And um, that's the most efficient way, but we know that that can take a long time to get from zero to that. And most of us who've been doing this a long time have gone from very, very manual systems to things that are very much more automated. So if you are new to this, um, know that we have all been, been there and been through that. Uh, then you need to implement a process to review and classify cases within the surveillance system. Um, there's some states that have tried some automation of this. Um, I will let them speak to that. We don't do as much of that, but we try and make it as efficient as possible. Um, and then be able to extract the data from the surveillance system for reporting to CDC. Oh, sorry, that's a double slide. My apologies. Um, and then for chronic hepatitis B, also then do investigations, document your procedures for how you're going to do that, um, identifying priority populations, because for most places, you can't do it all. Um, I guess no one can do it all, but you really can't do uh, it all with chronic hepatitis B. Um, conducting investigations for priority reports or populations, things like this might be women of childbearing age or um, cases with indications of acute infection or in other um, high-risk populations. Establish a protocol for identifying investigating healthcare-associated infections, and there's a lot of good information about that um, in the guidance and links to some CDC guidance on how to do that. And then um, establish a protocol for identifying and investigating other unique exposures, which can be quite challenging, especially in the chronic world. But when you think about the fact that obviously chronic and acute are closely tied, um, there can be some ways to go about that. And then quality assurance, making sure you're deduplicating, cleaning, reviewing, standardizing, um, and assessing things as much as possible. And that, that often is a step two um, after you get the information start flowing into the system. Uh, and uh, create for analyses, creating some sort of annual or more frequent uh, product that you can share with uh, internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, community organizations, um, other public health agencies, advocates, um, and then use those data uh, to form policy, both uh, policy for how you get data, um, how do you um, get data reported, who needs to report the data, um, and what should be reportable, um, but then also using information um, to guide things like counseling and referral to treatment and care as much as possible. And I know for a lot of people that's going to feel really big if you haven't been doing this, um, but it is something that, um, you know, is, is an ultimate goal. Um, and then explore how to obtain additional data sources if you have that capacity, vital records, and other, um, other data that might be available to you. 
Um, here is the chronic hepatitis B surveillance case definition. Again, I'll leave that um, to review for you to review at another time. Um, there's two parts to it, the criteria and the classification that didn't come into play as much with acute hepatitis B. With chronic hepatitis B, we really do look at both confirmed and probable cases. So it is important to both look at the criteria you use to classify a case, but then also how those criteria are used um, in classification. Uh, I'm going to just do one of these examples, and again, I apologize, but we're going to revisit our 57-year-old male who now presents for follow-up of his acute hepatitis B infection at nine months. Um, he has not been seen between. Um, nine months ago, he had a seven-day history of headache, nausea, and one day of history of yellow eyes, to remember that. He met the acute hepatitis B case definition, and his provider diagnosed him. Um, and now he has ongoing abdominal pain and fatigue and no testing since the additional diagnosis. So again, those questions, do we have enough information to classify him as a case of chronic hepatitis B? If not, what do we need? Um, so additional lab testing is done um, and we can see that um, there's several things here and you can take a look at them. Again, I won't have time and I apologize, but you can see he is still surface antigen positive and his, he still has detectable DNA. The provider does diagnose chronic hepatitis B based on those test results and his clinical assessment. So the question is, do we now have enough information? If not, what do we need? Um, and what are the key factors that indicate this person has chronic hepatitis B? Um, and I'm gonna walk through this case criteria one time here. So he is again, oh, he's 57, I apologize. Um, oh, going through everything. Um, meets criteria, has abdominal pain, symptoms are can be present or not, um, is, uh, has two surface engines nine months apart, does not meet the acute, the acute case definition. Um, and uh, you can see here, there's the diagnostic lab criteria and the presumptive lab criteria. I'm sorry, this is so fast to be doing this. Um, the diagnostic lab criteria are both true, but the presumptive lab criteria are not because uh, you do have to keep, that. this would mean that you'd only had one test. In this case, he has two. Um, in this case, for the case status, um, in, the, in the actually, classification portion um, does meet the acute, the, sorry, the confirmed chronic case definition, but not the probable chronic case definition. Um, you have to have both of these to meet the, um, the confirmed, and he does. You'd have to have all these to meet the probable, and he does not. I'm not going to go through case two. Um, it's a little trickier, so if you want to challenge yourself, I encourage you. I want to thank the ac acute hepatitis B workgroup members. Um, Jill was the lead and I tried to step in for her today and um, I hope I did her group's work justice. So thank you to all the people on that team. And then I wanna thank my work group um, who worked on the chronic hepatitis B with me, uh, with chronic hepatitis B with me. I really appreciate it. Um, they were key to understanding all of this and all had really good insights. Um, and thank you. And here's my email address and you can certainly contact me anytime um, if you have questions. And again, I'm sorry, this was so speedy. Uh, it was a lot to cover in the short time. Okay, um, my name is Kelly Gillespie and I will be going over the uh, Perry B. Let me pull up the slide squeeze out real quick. Okay, so I'm gonna be looking at perinatal hep B in pregnant persons, sorry, hepatitis B in pregnant persons and then perinatal hep B. So a person has a 90% chance of a lifelong hep B infection if the disease is acquired as an infant, specifically via vertical transmission. Um, this likelihood is greatly reduced if the child receives timely immunoprophylaxis at time of birth. So that's the hep B immunoglobulin um, called HBIG and the first dose of the hep B vaccine. Um, the key to prevent this transmission is identification. Identification of pregnant persons living with Hep B and identification of infants who were exposed to Hep B during gestation and delivery. Identification and monitoring is achieved at the health department level via surveillance data. However, this data is a multifaceted resource and it can be used to ensure recommendations um, for prenatal screens, ensure that they're being followed, uh, reveal the incidence and prevalence of Hep B among persons of childbearing years, um, indicating the potential for future surveillance activities among this group, um, and assess missed opportunities for identification of pregnant persons to incomplete uh, vaccination of exposed children. Additionally, surveillance data is used to monitor the efforts of the perinatal hepatitis B prevention program, which I won't get into, it's a whole thing unto itself, 
Um, but uh, every health jurisdiction has one. And so you can use your data to help assess the efforts of that. So looking at hepatitis B in a pregnant person. Identification of a hepatitis B pro positive pregnant person is largely through electronic reporting of labs to disease surveillance system. As resources allow, additional methodologies for identification include actively obtaining pregnancy status for a known hep B positive person able to bear children and enhanced surveillance activities, such as comparing vital statistic data to hep B cases in a disease surveillance system to identify recent deliveries to a hep B positive person. As with any activity that relies on surveillance data, it's largely a passive process. However, some ways to increase the ability to identify hep B positive pregnant persons during pregnancy include education of providers to ensure that they screen all pregnant persons during each pregnancy. This allows for time for coordination to ensure that the infant will receive HBIG, that's that immunoglobulin, and the first dose of hep B within 12 hours of birth. And for those pregnant persons who do test um, hep B positive, it's recommended to test um, for hep B viral load in the third trimester. And if the viral load is greater than 200,000 international units per mil, treatment is recommended to further reduce transmission. If a person does not get tested during prenatal care, either because the provider didn't test or the person didn't receive prenatal care, the delivery facility is the next safety net for identification. Ensure that delivery facilities have standing orders to determine a person's hep B status upon admission and to test or retest if a person is experiencing symptoms of hepatitis, if their status is unknown, or if the person say they tested negative, but they have known risk factors for hep B, they should be tested again. Moving on to perinatal hep B. So we've all seen these case um, ascertainment flow charts. They all look crazy. This is really a reference slide for you guys to have and print out um, and have next to you. Um, but um, I did want to point out some major decision points and I've put, it, uh, I've put little red stars by them. Specifically, these help you decide whether they meet case definition or not. So child's age, they gotta be under, um, they gotta be two or under. Country of birth, they have to be born in the US. Hep B status of their birth parent needs to be Hep B positive, and the child's labs, and we'll get into that. If they don't meet the classification for perinatal, they should then be assessed for acute or chronic Hep B. So this is another reference slide. It outlines the criteria um, for the CDC CSTE case definition for peri. Uh, Perry B. The only difference between a confirmed and a chronic case is that a confirmed case has an established epi link between the child and the birth parent, so that the birth parent has hep, had hep B at the time that they were pregnant and gave birth. A probable case is where this link, this link cannot be established, so maybe you don't know the parent's um, hep B status. I want to focus in on the laboratory criteria, as this can get really nuanced. Um, an accepted Hep B lab for case classification includes Hep B surface antigen taken between one and 24 months of age and has been more than four weeks from their most recent dose of the Hep B vaccine. This waiting period is important because recent vaccination can cause a false positive uh, with surface antigen labs. So it's helpful to know that routine Hep B vaccination for children occurs at birth, one month, and six months um, at their well child visit. Also note that surface antigen labs taken under one month of age can be a false positive due to the gestational parent's blood still in the infant. E antigen and DNA labs are acceptable. Also, if taken between nine and 24 months of age, labs drawn before nine months of age shouldn't be used because they may also have a false positive due to the HBIG that was given at birth. And we'll look at all that in our case scenarios. So let's look at one of them. Um, Y'all receive a positive DNA lab for an 18 month old child. Investigation reveals that, that the gestational parent has chronic Hep B and the family recently immigrated to the US. 
So we're going to look over the factors. While they meet the age requirement, they do not meet the requirement that they were born in the U.S. This child was born outside the U.S. and so would not be considered a case of peri hep B and should be examined to see if it meets acute or chronic hep B case definition. The next one we see you receive a positive surface antigen uh, for a two month old um, born to a known hep B positive birth parent. An investigation determined that the lab was drawn the same day as the child was given a dose of the hep B vaccine. So while this patient meets demographic criteria, there's an epi link and they even meet the lab criteria, but because they were tested less than four weeks after given a dose of the hep B vaccine, you can't determine the status at this time. Um, the recommendations that the child should be retested at a time when it's been more than a month since their last um, hep B vaccine. Finally, you receive post-vaccine serological testing, uh, referred to as PVST, um, results from a child who's one years old um, and born to a known hep B positive birth parent. The results are surface antigen positive, surface antibody negative. This, this kiddo meets the demographic criteria, there's an epi link and the laboratory criteria. And this would be considered a confirmed case of perinatal hep hepatitis B and should then be reported. So we'll do some quick look at case investigations. Most case investigation elements are needed for both the hep B positive birth parent and the exposed infant. And they include your basic demographics, provider information, and hep B lab results. For the pregnant person, it's also important to know when and where they expect to deliver so that uh, the local health jurisdiction can coordinate with that facility to ensure that timely immunoprophylaxis is available and will be administered. Additionally, the pregnant person's viral load should be monitored during the third trimester. We talked about this before to determine if uh, treatment is indicated. And if so, it's important to document if that um, medication was actually taken. The exposed child should have documentation for each dose in the vaccine series, as well as the date and time for um, the immunoglobulin HBIG. And these elements help to track the effectiveness of the perinatal hepatitis B prevention program. When resources are limited, there are things that increase identification and prevention. So these are the most bang for your um, public health buck. Um, so you want to prioritize investigation of hep B positive pregnant persons before they deliver if possible, right? Uh, this allows for uh, time for notification of providers and delivery facilities, as well as education of the parent of what's going to happen moving forward and tracking the child and whatnot. Additionally, following up with the heavy positive pregnant persons who are, who are able to bear children uh, who have an unknown pregnancy status, um, especially among those who have elevated hep B DNA levels and or or, and or, you know, as your resources allow, co-infected with HIV, hepatitis C, or an STI. I want to take a moment to uh, thank my work group members, and without their help, this wouldn't have been possible. Uh, Jesse, Lindsay, Lee, Rose, and Brianna. I think Bri is next. All right, thank you everyone. Um, my name is Brie Barbeau and today I'll be giving an overview of acute hepatitis C surveillance and case management. So hepatitis C is a disease caused by the hepatitis C virus and is one of the most common bloodborne pathogens in the US. HCV is most efficient, efficiently transmitted through blood to blood contact or through percutaneous exposure to blood and injection drug use is now one of the most common risk behaviors reported for hepatitis C infection. So cases of acute hepatitis C have increased um, rapidly in the US since 2010, many of those being associated with injection drug use. In 2019, uh, rates of acute hepatitis C increased once again with 4,136 cases being reported in the US for a rate of 1.3 per 100,000 persons. 
Among the 1,952 cases that were reported with injection drug use information available, 1,302 or 67% of those cases did report IDU. The epidemiology of hepatitis C in the United States has really changed substantially in the last several years. Um, after decades of a decline in acute hepatitis C incidence, our rates began increasing again in 2010. Um, increases in both acute and chronic hepatitis C um, associated with injection drug use shifted from people being born during 1945 to 1965, also known as the baby boomer population, to a younger population. And in 2019, the highest rates have occurred among um, persons aged 20 to 39 years, which is consistent with the age groups that have been most impacted by the nation's opioid crisis. So improving hepatitis C surveillance is an important component for eliminating hepatitis C. Surveillance data can be used to inform and improve public health interventions, such as monitoring trends in disease incidents and determining risk behaviors or exposures, identifying outbreaks, assessing missed opportunities for prevention and needs for education, and really understanding the burden of hepatitis C in the community. So the primary method for ascertaining acute hepatitis C cases is by investigating reports from laboratories, uh, healthcare facilities, and healthcare providers. The laboratory markers shown here are, are recommended for reporting to public health to really aid in case ascertainment, case classification, and monitoring cure continua for hepatitis C. Um, and that includes anti-HCV, um, all positive results and negative, if possible, hepatitis C RNA, uh, both positive negative results, including quantitative, qualitative, and genotype testing, um, HCV antigen, uh, positive, negative, and indeterminate results if and when a test is approved. Um, and jurisdictions are strongly encouraged to incorporate the reporting of negative or undetectable HCV RNA test results into their surveillance regulations and systems to support improved understanding of their local epidemic. Um, the table below, table 4.1, illustrates how different hepatitis C lab results should be interpreted and actions for cases who might meet those criteria. Um, for example, a reactive hepatitis C antibody alone indicates current or past infection with hepatitis C and should be interpreted as presumptive um, hepatitis C case, while a positive hepatitis C antibody coupled with a positive NAT or RNA test would indicate current um, hepatitis C infection and follow-up should occur to ensure that the patient is provided with appropriate counseling and linkage to care. Others, other examples of um, interpretation and action are contained within the viral hepatitis surveillance guidance document and on this slide for future reference. So other sources of case ascertainment include healthcare facility and provider reporting, as well as supplemental sources of information such as medical records, hospital discharge databases, and death and birth certificates. Um, the automated collection of hepatitis C laboratory results will, in many jurisdictions, lead to a high volume of reporting. And even with that automated reporting, many jurisdictions may lack the resources needed to conduct investigations for all acute hepatitis C cases. So um, when considering prioritization for um, acute hepatitis C case follow-up, um, I noted a couple things that jurisdictions may want to um, consider here. So conducting semi-automated or preliminary collection of risk data without, uh, excuse me, combined with more targeted follow-up on cases without anticipated risk history could decrease the volume of number of cases that uh, would need to be followed up on. Targeting efforts to demographic groups that might be at higher risk of acquiring or transmitting infection. So people who inject drugs, people living with HIV, pregnant people, and other cases and clusters of public health importance. Targeting efforts based on specific settings within a jurisdiction. So maybe looking at syringe service providers or substance use disorder treatment facilities, um, correctional facilities, homeless service providers, 
or other areas where known risk behaviors are occurring or rates of newly reported infections are increasing. And then really supplementing case surveillance data with data sources to provide information about higher risk populations and the evolving epidemiology of acute hepatitis infections, such as looking at state drug use databases, overdose databases, um, those types of things. So this table demonstrates the surveillance case criteria for both acute and chronic hepatitis C cases, including the age, clinical, confirmatory laboratory, and presumptive laboratory criteria. I won't go into too much detail here, but um, just looking at the table, someone um, must be over the age of 36 months, have jaundice or elevated LFTs, um, an absence of a more likely diagnosis for the clinical criteria, and then either confirmatory or presumptive lab evidence. So this table demonstrates the case definitions for both confirmed and probable acute and chronic hepatitis C cases. So looking at this, we can see, um, for example, that a confirmed acute hepatitis C case must be over the age of 36 months, um, meet the clinical criteria, and have confirmatory lab evidence or documentation of seroconversion, whereas a confirmed chronic case uh, would not meet clinical um, criteria but might have confirmatory lab evidence and no documentation of seroconversion. So figure 4.2, um, this is the, the case ascertainment chart that you guys have seen a couple of times now. Um, this illustrates a potential approach for acute and chronic hepatitis C case ascertainment and classification that's really broken out by minimum to moderate resource and high resource activities. And of course, specific procedures and um, capacity will vary by jurisdiction. Um, but I wanted to review a couple of scenarios and walk you all through the case, um, the case chart here. So um, the first scenario, a primary care provider reported a positive hepatitis C RNA result in a person 24 years of age. Liver function tests show a peak ALT level of 236, but jaundice is not present. There is not a more likely diagnosis than acute hepatitis C, and the patient could not be matched with an existing acute or chronic case of hepatitis C. So walking through the chart on the right here, um, we can see that we did have a positive lab result that was reported from a provider. Um, is the patient an existing chronic event in the surveillance system? No. Is the patient newly reported to your surveillance system? And we know that it is, so we would move over here. Um, do we have a positive hepatitis C detection test? And the answer is yes, so we know this would be a confirmed hepatitis C case. Um, now we will move over to determine the acute or chronic case status. Um, so we go down here, does the patient have jaundice or total billy over three or ALT over 200? Um, and we know that in this scenario, the person had an ALT of 236. So we say yes. Is there a more likely diagnosis to explain the clinical evidence? No. So we would classify this case as a confirmed acute hepatitis C case. Um, and I just want to note for chronic hepatitis C, um, it would need to meet the following criteria. So in this scenario, if the patient did not have elevated ALT, um, or if there was an alternative more likely diagnosis of chronic hepatitis C, or if there was an existing um, acute hepatitis C event in the system for more than one year after the specimen collection date without evidence of um, the person clearing infection, then we would classify this case as a newly reported confirmed chronic hepatitis C case. So moving on to another scenario, um, the health department received a positive anti-hepatitis C, anti-HCV laboratory result in a person 20 years of age. The person's hepatitis C RNA status is unknown. Through provider follow-up, it was determined that the patient presented with nausea, fatigue, and jaundice, and the peak ALT level was 642. There is not a more likely diagnosis than acute hepatitis C, and again, the patient couldn't be matched with an existing acute 
or chronic case of hepatitis C in the surveillance system. So again, moving through this um, ascertainment chart on the right, um, we did have a positive lab re result um, that was reported. Is it an existing event? No. Um, is it newly reported into our system? Yes. So we would move over here. Do we have a positive hepatitis C detection test that was reported? Um, per the scenario, this information was not available. So we would come over here to the right. Um, was a positive uh, HCV antibody test reported? Yes. So we know that this will um, likely meet the criteria for a probable um, hepatitis C case. And then we'll move over here to determine acute or chronic status. So does the person have jaundice or total billy over three or ALT over 200? Um, according to the scenario, we know that the ALT was over 200. So we say yes, um, lack of an alternative diagnosis. And then we would determine that this case is in fact a probable acute hepatitis C case. So I just want to acknowledge all of the um, he acute hepatitis C work group participants and thank them for their help in completing this. And I will now turn the time over to Lindsay to discuss chronic hep C. Thank you. Hi, everyone. As mentioned, I'm Lindsay Sizemore, and I was the lead for the chronic hepatitis C within the guidance document. I'd like to spend a few minutes today sharing the best practices for core surveillance and really encourage you to read the guidance document as it really is the blueprint for viral hepatitis surveillance. And first, a very quick background. The prevalence of chronic hepatitis C virus was estimated to be 1% during 2013 to 2016, which represents 2.4 million adults. Jurisdictional specific estimates are more useful for program planning and evaluation at the jurisdictional level. In addition, nearly one half of people living with hepatitis C are unaware of their infection status and can unknowingly transmit the virus to others. And there's no vaccine to prevent hepatitis C. However, there is a cure. So the overall goal, goals of chronic hepatitis C surveillance are to measure and characterize the burden of infection and disease, and if feasible, create person level systems or registries. Person level data enable classification of those living with hepatitis C along the care continuum from screening and diagnosis to linkage to care, treatment and cure, helping jurisdictions inform and evaluate the impact of hepatitis C elimination activities. So a person level um, surveillance database can support hepatitis C elimination efforts by allowing a jurisdiction to document a person's hepatitis C laboratory testing history. And this can include providing information on the number of people at each phase of the hepatitis C cure continuum to identify areas for improvement, tracking the number of unique persons living with hepatitis C longitudinally, which can inform more accurate estimates of incidence and prevalence, identifying and linking people living with hepatitis C to medical care, and matching with supplemental data sources. Linking a person level surveillance database to other data sources allows for longitudinal monitoring of disease outcomes and improves completeness of information in the surveillance system. And so my um, scenario looks different than everyone else's. So it's, um, you're just establishing hepatitis C surveillance in your jurisdiction, and what should your initial priorities be? So really you're gonna wanna refer to the guidance and more specifically the hepatitis C surveillance guidance and the best practice models for core and enhanced chronic hepatitis C surveillance. And so in this scenario, you will focus on the core section, which I'm gonna cover over the next few slides. However, I did wanna mention that if your jurisdiction wants ideas on how to enhance existing surveillance, please refer to the enhanced section of the best practice model. So where do you start? So Kristen presented on this in her chronic hepatitis B section, so I won't repeat it because the same is true for hepatitis C, but I'll leave it here for your reference. And again, a lot of the upcoming slides are similar to what Kristen presented, but I wanted to spend a little more time here. So you're really gonna need to think through case investigations and what this will look like for your jurisdiction. You'll need to document local procedures for case investigations, including defining priority populations for your jurisdiction. You're gonna need to conduct case investigations for these priority populations where feasible. 
And these case investigations can include reviewing electronic medical records, communicating with providers or healthcare facilities via phone, and interviewing patients to collect demographic risk and clinical information. And you will need to establish a protocol for identifying and investigating healthcare associated infections. And depending on the structure of your health department, this might be conducted separately from hepatitis C surveillance, and you might be able to receive assistance from the healthcare associated infection staff. And you'll need to establish a protocol for identifying and investigating other unique exposures, including clusters or outbreaks of hepatitis C. You're gonna to need to determine what a quality assurance will look like for your hepatitis C data. And this should include establishing a process for data cleaning and standardizing laboratory reports, assessing case investigations and laboratory reports for completeness and accuracy, and identifying and reviewing potential duplicate laboratory reports, patients, and or case investigations and coming up with a mechanism to deduplicate. And you're really gonna to wanna to have a feedback loop for your data, meaning you're gonna to wanna to share it widely and bring attention to what your surveillance data shows. And so this can be an annual report, situational analysis or other data product based on your available resources. And you're gonna to need to be familiar with the policies that exist in your jurisdiction by researching existing health code or policy related to hepatitis C reporting and the process for changing such policies if necessary, identifying who should report hepatitis C cases, and the who can be healthcare providers, healthcare facilities, and or laboratories, and determining what should be reportable, which Bree covered in detail in her presentation when she discussed case ascertainment. And lastly, data sharing. You're gonna to wanna to research how to obtain access to supplemental sources of data to match your hepatitis C registry and help determine what's going on in your jurisdiction. So I was the one who got to present this information today. However, the chronic hepatitis C guidance would not have been possible without the chronic hepatitis C work group. And those members are shown on this slide. This was certainly a labor of love. And so I wanna thank each and every one of them for being such great partners in this endeavor. And here's my contact information. Should you have any questions after the discussion today, I'm happy to help and please feel free to contact me directly. And so with that, I will now turn it over to my friend and colleague Danica to discuss pregnancy and perinatal hepatitis C. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, okay, everybody, I know we are at the end and people are feeling all sorts of fatigue, but we're almost there. Um, so I am going to be, uh, as Lindsay said, presenting on surveillance of hepatitis C during pregnancy and perinatal hepatitis C. Um, with hepatitis C, there's been an increase um, amongst um, people who um, can give birth um, over the past years related to the opioid epidemic. And while treatment is not yet approved for um, infants or for pregnant people, um, it is important to be conducting surveillance um, as uh, interventions are possible and um, future opportunities for treatment may be coming down the pike. Um, and CDC, um, as of 2020, recommends um, hepatitis C screening during each pregnancy. Um, and perinatal hepatitis C became a nationally notifiable condition in 2018. So we're uh, working on some of the newest content here in the surveillance guidance. Um, it's important when thinking about um, uh, perinatal hepatitis C, just like with perinatal, perinatal hep B, um, in uh, two capacities. So looking at um, pregnancy um, and recently delivered hep C positive people and their infants and young children um, who may have been exposed to hepatitis C. When thinking about um, surveillance data um, for hep C during pregnancy, there's some peri, peri, parent oriented um, uh, uses of this data to ensure linkage to care for the hep C positive parent, um, as well as uh, prioritizing testing for their infants um, to identify any perinatal transmission that may have occurred. There's also jurisdictional oriented uses such as monitoring adherence to uh, pregnancy screening recommendations and um, monitoring the trend of, um, and, uh, of incidents and prevalence amongst these um, uh, childbearing parents. When thinking about the, the infant and child side of things for perinatal hepatitis C surveillance, uh, you can use this data um, for infant and children orientation um, 
uh, to uh, be identifying the children who um, test positive and uh, may be linked to care and ensuring that linkage um, is uh, occurring and in um, ensuring that providers are also educated um, about uh, methodologies around uh, pediatric and perinatal hepatitis C. And from a jurisdictional perspective, it's important to be uh, monitoring these trends um, in uh, perinatal incidents um, as this is gonna be an important component of any hepatitis C elimination activities. And um, from a program oriented standpoint, um, it's important to use this data as well to monitor and evaluate um, perinatal hep C programs, which many jurisdictions may not have, um, but uh, CDC has hinted at um, potential opportunities of having this in the future, and this will be critical again for elimination work. So in thinking about case ascertainment for perinatal hepatitis C, this can be a resource intensive activity just as with perinatal B, um, but there are tiered options. Um, and so everybody should be um, looking um, to the surveillance guidance and I'm happy to discuss with anybody as well about options that may work for your jurisdiction and whatever capacity you have. Um, for both um, uh, parents and for their infants, um, it's important to be confirming um, two components, uh, both that the pregnancy or, uh, and delivery um, happened, um, as well as the hep C infection of the, the parents. Um, so that's from the parent perspective. And then for, for the infant themselves, that their, their uh, parent was hep C positive and that the hep C infection has then been passed to the infant. So um, complete identification um, of all gesta gestational parents and their infant pairs is going to be difficult. Um, uh, depending on the, the activities you choose in your capacity. However, um, because of these multiple steps, it's important to um, be thinking about multiple methods to identify parents and infants, and that will um, improve uh, sensitivity and specificity of your activities. Um, in terms of the case definition for perinatal hepatitis C, um, a detectable um, uh, NAT for hep C RNA is uh, required as and it being performed um, between two and 36 months of age uh, is, is critical. Um, before two months of age, uh, the hep C RNA should not be um, considered uh, diagnostic or uh, uh, valid for the case definition. And then that epi link with the gestational parent with a hep C infection is important and no other known exposures such as a healthcare um, exposure or other um, exposure. So when going through the, the chart, which um, you guys are, are sick of these. I'm gonna just do it really quickly and stepwise. Um, uh, that first report comes in, whether it's um, uh, the lab report themselves, um, knowing the exposure from a parent or a report from a provider. Um, if it's a positive hep C antibody um, and no detection, uh, hep C detection test is re uh, reported, um, and that is a um, RNA or an, an antigen um, if it becomes FDA approved in the United States. Um, if an antibody test is reported, um, you also need that hep C RNA test. And so um, you, if you, it's not initially reported, um, you uh, have, if you have capacity, um, can make the recommendation to the provider um, to confirm the infection with this RNA test. Um, it may come in initially, um, depending on the provider's knowledge of the testing. Um, if that test is um, uh, positive, uh, that uh, hep C detection test is negative. Um, even though you have the antibody um, positive test, um, this is going to not be a confirmed um, perinatal case. Um, if there is no detection test um, uh, performed at all, you're also going to end up with a um, case that you cannot confirm as a perinatal infection. If you do have a positive um, detection test reported, uh, you have to confirm the perinatal exposure. If you're um, uh, able to do that, um, this will be a confirmed uh, perinatal case, but if you're not able to confirm it and you're not aware um, or no other exposure is reported, you will also be uh, confirming this as a perinatal hep C case. Uh, if the uh, exposure is not perinatal, um, you will assess um, this case uh, using the acute and chronic hep C case definitions. So some real quick case examples um, for a, um, uh, perinatal hep C example, uh, we have a reactive hep C antibody reported for an eight month old infant and um, the uh, parent is known to have um, hep C RNA uh, detectable uh, during their pregnancy. So this epi link is confirmed. 
However, because it's just an antibody, um, we do not have a confirmed perinatal hep C case here. We would recommend, um, as capacity permits, to contact the pediatrician to test infant um, for the RNA test. I am kind of a crossover with um, uh, Lindsay's approach. Um, I have a health department capacity example. Um, a health department has 0.2 um, of a epi's time to work on perinatal hep C. Um, they cannot do um, complete uh, capacity, uh, complete follow-up of all childbearing parents. Um, and we know that um, the prevalence of hep C is increasing amongst um, uh, people who can become pregnant in this jurisdiction. Um, and a few uh, reports of hep C antibody positive infants has already been reported. So some action um, items that could be possible are um, for this epidemiologist's um, uh, capacity is to um, be doing some uh, matching, whoop, I skipped, uh, matching between um, uh, the birth uh, parents or the birth registries and the hep C registries um, to also be matching to IIS data to identify pediatricians for these infants. Um, creating a form letter and being able to bulk send them to pediatrician, um, notifying them of exposure um, or testing guidance um, uh, for exposed infants in general um, uh, at a non-patient specific level um, and uh, doing um, uh, reaching out to ordering provider of any infant who is tested for antibody um, but not RNA uh, to share with them the recommendation for that follow-up testing. Some policy changes may include um, pregnancy um, uh, making pregnancy reportable in hep C positive people and further prioritization, just like with um, hepatitis B um, in pregnancy, um, follow up with people who um, pregnancy status is unknown, HIV positive people um, and um, uh, people with um, a high viral loads for hepatitis C and pregnancy. So that was a whirlwind. Um, I couldn't have done it without my amazing um, partners in this endeavor. Johanna, Rachel, Fatima, Amelia, and Susan, um, who uh, made this all possible. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I love talking about this um, and we're all still learning. So please um, don't hesitate um, to uh, talk more with me further. Thanks everyone. Oh, wonderful. Um, thank you, Danica, and to all of our presenters for providing so much in-depth information and for thoughtfully demonstrating how viral hepatitis surveillance can be put into practice and the types of decisions that can be made when presented with certain scenarios. Um, we are now moving into the Q&A and open discussion part of our session. Please feel free to use the raise hand feature under reactions and I will call on you to unmute your mic um, and you can then ask your question. You may also um, type your question or comments um, into the chat box. Um, I did uh, recopy one of the questions just to kind of get, um, you know, conversations flowing um, and I, have a question to get some um, discussion going. Um, this question is for um, Lindsay, Kristen, um, other leads in other jurisdictions who have expertise with this, um, basically uh, developing algorithms to deduplicate your case surveillance data for chronic hepatitis B and C. Um, can you describe your jurisdiction's process for deduplication? Um, what tools or software you would use to automate the deduplication process? Um, basically, what would a jurisdiction need to do to begin this process? Well, I can I can answer with um, one of those answers that's useful to the people it's useful for and not for the others. Um, so we use a um, Maven uh, based system. Oh, look, lots of nodding. So there are several people who are also in that boat, which has a deduplication process, which I will not say is perfect. It still requires a lot of manual review. Um, I know there are systems out there that do a lot better. Um, so if you're using something that is a pre-built product like that, um, a lot of that will be built in, um, but obviously there's other solutions. So um, pass it on to someone if there's other views on that. So in Tennessee, we actually use NBS. Um, and I would say it's a huge lift to deduplicate. So we have to think about it in terms of duplicate patients and also in terms of duplicate investigations for the same condition. 
So in terms of duplicate patients, which we see a lot of as a result of ELR, um, and COVID has certainly not made that any better, um, we will merge those patients. And then with duplicate investigation, so let's say that so in Tennessee, we will only create one chronic hepatitis C investigation. There should never be more than one. And if for some reason one is created an error, we'll make the most recent one not a case and then attach everything to the first one. Um, so we kind of do that ongoing, but then every year when we go to freeze our data and use that for heavy profiles and data requests and things like that, we will do it again and we use SAS to deduplicate that way. Thank you, Kristen and Lindsay. Anyone else have anything else to, to add? Okay, and it looks like we have a, um, uh, Nicola Thompson, you, ha you have a question. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks um, to all the presenters today, a wealth of information. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I did have a, several of the definitions all include the term or similar to absence of a more likely diagnosis. And I was just wondering if we could hear, obviously I think the amount of effort that goes into or the type of information that's available can help rule in or out that piece of the definition. I just wondered if we could hear from folks about um, the efforts they go to to identify uh, a more likely diagnosis or things that may be really high yield um, to, to go for or look for. Um, so I can start with Hefe briefly. Um, as I mentioned during my talk, we are de decentralized in Ohio, so our local health departments are really in charge of the case ascertainment and follow-up. And many of them have direct lines into our hospital systems, for instance, so they can see additional medical records and things like that. Um, so for them, it's just part of their normal workload when they're working on these individual cases. Some of the things that we see regularly for hepatitis A that would be uh, showing similar symptoms, but also not, uh, they are more likely diagnosis would be things like liver cancer, cirrhosis, drug toxicity, sometimes gallbladder and bile duct issues can also, so we'll get maybe a positive IgM, the symptoms line up, but the doctor has said, no, this is really something different. Um, we also see autoimmune hepatitis on occasion as well. And I'll just agree with Brandy on that. I think, you know, we basically do the same thing in most of the time, unless it was a very unusual situation, we would not go outside of using the case definition and the provider diagnosis to decide whether there is a more, um, you know, a, a more likely diagnosis. So we don't like dive in and try and decide ourselves. Is there something more likely unless it's a very rare circumstance in which we feel like everything is pointing a different direction. So it's usually the case definition or the provider is diagnosed something like liver cancer or um, autoimmune hepatitis or gallbladder, um, gallstones, you know, that re re resolved immediately after surgery. Um, so it's really trying to figure out what the provider diagnosed, which I guess I found is to be, we're a centralized state. So we do um, a lot of the work within the state health department and usually getting what the provider diagnosed with isn't too huge of a lift um, to, to do because that's usually pretty readily available in a chart. Yeah, thank you all for providing that insight. I, I think, you know, as, as things progress and, you know, um, COVID is, is now becoming, you know, more uh, prevalent. Um, ha have you all encountered um, the use of COVID-19 as an alternative likely diagnosis? I know persons with um, existing liver disease um, could, present with more severe illness um, if they're also concurrently infected with COVID-19. I think we're sort of still in the early stages and that would require some additional special studies to further tease out. Are there any other um, questions? I do see some um, that are coming through in the chat box. Um, uh, thank you, Kelly, for providing some guidance to Rachel on deduplication. 
Um, Rachel, did, did you have anything else to add or, or ask? Uh, looks like Rachel McLean. Hi, sorry, I was trying to find the unmute. Um, I just, I don't know, we're just, we developed our registry like 10 years ago and now we're kind of, it's like an albatross that we're carrying around and um, we just have a lot of problems. And I don't know if other people are having this issue, but we posted a position for an informaticist and the candidates that we got were just like beyond terrible because during COVID it's like, you know, EPIs are a hot commodity. And so we just need a lot of help with data QA and just like streamlining our processes. And it's like, who I'm kind of waiting for like a, you know, a knight in shining armor a little bit, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> so you were just talking about deduplication. So I was just sharing our pain mostly. Hang in there, Rachel. Now it looks like we have a question um, from Brianna um, in Colorado of a case scenario. So I think this will be directed towards Kristen um, to determine acute hepatitis B. The patient had a positive surface antigen, um, also positive IgM. They had high uh, detectable DNA um, and also um, positive for E antigen. Um, the liver enzymes, ALT, AST fluctuated at one point was 131 and 173, no symptoms and total billy was normal. The patient denied sexual contact or um, IDU. They had alcohol abuse um, and strep pneumonia at the time of their hep B diagnosis. Um, she had indicated that they determined this was not acute. So would that make this a probable chronic case, Kristen? This was, I, I enjoyed this one. It was like an adventure reading it um, uh, and a little test. I love hep B serology. All my friends on the screen, I'm calling you all my friends now because um, we're on a screen together. Uh, even though those of you have never met before in person, but uh, I see you all doing the same thing. Hep B is super cool because of the, the fun serology. For all of you who find it painful right now, I promise you once you get past a certain point, it's really fun. Everyone believes they will never get it. And then everyone does and it becomes fun. So I just want to tell you that. So I don't know, Brianna, I'm not saying that this is a complicated one or I wouldn't call it complicated as much as unsatisfactory. Um, this is one of those times where a case definition can't capture every possible scenario. And unless this person had a negative test previously for hepatitis B greater than six months before, um, like the, we don't have a serum or within six months, sorry, uh, we don't have a serum wouldn't be able to call them a zero converter in the absence of symptoms, couldn't count this case as an acute case. And that would make this person a probable chronic. Um, hopefully this person would get appropriate follow-up care, have some additional testing at six months or longer and see if they uh, did, you know, zero revert to negative for surface antigen. Um, there are so many parts of this I'd love to chat about and break down and talk about more about what sort of, what weighs in on each side of my, like, what do I really believe is happening here? Um, thing, but I'll leave that because I know we have limited time. But these are the cases where I would say whether you can count them as a case or not is going to maybe feel unsatisfying to you. This one feels pretty split to me. It's not like a slam dunk. It's a cute, but for one thing, this one could probably go either way. Um, but uh, this is where you can hope that the physician and the treating provider is confident in their diagnosis, which is a different thing than a case classification. And I always think that's really important for people when they're starting out in the hepatitis world is remembering that your case classification does not deny this person a diagnosis of acute hepatitis B by their healthcare provider. And if they, they do have something going on in that area that they would get appropriate care from their provider based on that diagnosis. So hopefully that is, that is help. Um, it's very unsatisfying. They can't place it somewhere. So it would be a probable chronic. So you can place it somewhere in the probable chronic. Um, and we did change things with the HEPI case definition several years ago to allow um, for that to be a little easier because there used to be like when, if someone was IgM positive, they kind of could never be anywhere um, if they weren't acute. So thank you and a uh, great question. And I could talk about it for hours, but I won't. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so there's another question from Saul um, directed at Brandy. Since the hepatitis A outbreak is still ongoing, are all states um, still asking for genotyping? I know that the CDC viral, Division of Viral Hepatitis has specific criteria for accepting specimens for genotyping. Um, 
And so the process at this point is still to reach out and contact them to get approval before sending specimens for genotyping. But I know they certainly are still providing genotyping. You know, in Ohio at this point, um, we're not really seeing too many cases in new areas and we're not really seeing them in people that don't fall into one of those risk groups that I talked about that are uh, really driving the, the multi-state outbreak. So we're not sending specimens at this point very often, but um, you have to go through the approval process. And I know that some of the folks here from the Division of Viral Hepatitis for CDC might have additional information about that. Yeah, I see um, a couple of our colleagues. Um, I don't know if everyone, Not anyone to call wants her to out, in. but I saw Martha Montgomery on yeah. here. <laughs> And I know in Philly, we are seeing um, new cases. The outbreak has kind of ticked back up and um, they are requesting genotype testing. Great, thank you. Um, all right, I have another question for um, all of you. So collaboration and uh, supporting local health jurisdictions are an important piece of building surveillance capacity. Um, especially in jurisdictions that are decentralized. Um, for our, our work group leads, um, could you discuss ways in which your state health department can improve capacity of local health departments for case investigations? Um, Bria, I know that in Utah, you have a pretty solid infrastructure for providing assistance um, and incentives with case investigations at the, the local health jurisdiction. So I didn't know if um, you would like to um, explain more about the process that, that you do. Yeah, so um, as part of our funding that we received under 1703 previously, um, we were able to fund some of our seven of our 13 local health jurisdictions to conduct enhanced surveillance for um, acute hepatitis B and C cases. Um, and we've been able to extend that funding for them under 2103, um, and we're now funding all of our jurisdictions to continue that, that um, surveillance and case investigation process. Um, however, as many people have probably experienced during COVID, a lot of our local health departments um, were focused on, you know, COVID investigations. And so we had um, one of our, our state health department staff, we have a viral hepatitis DIS um, at the state health department um, who was assisting with case investigations during that time, um, which has really increased our ability to continue that work um, for acute hepatitis B and C surveillance. Um, and as Kathleen mentioned, yes, we were um, previously incentivizing um, folks who would participate in, in case investigation. So cases that we identified that were acute hepatitis B or C to um, participate in the case investigation process and share information about um, any contacts that they might've had that, so that we could follow up on those as well. Um, and that proved to be fairly successful um, when we were doing that, so yeah. Thank you, Bree. Um, are there any other of our leads or um, other jurisdictions who would like to share? Oh, I see um, Tabitha, you've raised your hand. Uh, I, uh, would you like to ask a question? I know we're limited on time, so go ahead and um, you can unmute and, and. Okay, thank you, sorry. <laughs> I had a um, quick question on the Hep C perinatal cases, the children that were um, under 36 months of age, but they didn't meet the perinatal case definition, the algorithm showed to see if they met the probable or chronic Hep C case definition. But on the CDC site, it says for clinical criteria that all Hep C virus cases in each classification category should be greater than 36 months of age unless known to have been exposed non-perinatally. So I just wonder how you guys handle that if you don't know whether or not they were exposed non-perinatally. Yeah, so this is this is crossover with uh, with uh, Lindsay's stuff and and mine. So um, yeah, so if they're um, under the 36 month mark, we would we would then be not even considering them, um, or excuse me, 
and we know that they're not perinatally exposed, that's those are that's the time where it capitates over to the chronic. So um, uh, we would then be following any of those case definitions. And um, you know, I think too, this is where um, the the longitudinal um, registries is going to become important as um, as children age, um, being able to um, uh, make sure they're fitting in in case definitions there as well. And so. Um, making sure that um, you're tracking cases um, uh, in perpetuity uh, is going to be critical. Lindsay, I don't know if you you want to chime in too. Yeah, I would say also, you know, there are, there are things that get reported to CDC, and there are things that. So I'll give you an example. For perinatal hepatitis C, it's very complicated, right? Like you very rarely, as Kristen says, have a slam dunk where it's confirmed, everything gets sent off, and everybody's on the same page. Oftentimes, it's somewhere in the middle. And so we'll use the probable status for, for local for us to say we're monitoring this and it's not going to be sent to CDC, but we know that we need to keep an eye on it. So keep in mind that you can get creative like that in your jurisdiction as well. Great. Thank you, both Danica and Lindsay. Um, so it looks like we're at the half of the hour. Um, so we'll have to wrap things up, unfortunately. Um, we hope that you found the information provided by our work group leaders to be useful and the conversations to be informative as you embark on your viral hepatitis surveillance activities and even for jurisdictions that are further along. Um, we hope that you found the content um, useful and applicable to your daily, daily work. Um, I think uh, Isabel had posted a um, evaluation uh, survey for the session, um, please remember to complete that evaluation. Um, there's also a, a question in the evaluation survey where you can indicate if you would like to have any um, additional content or hepatitis condition um, covered uh, during a future um, session. Um, so please uh, remember to fill out that survey. Um, if you have any questions about any of the surveillance guidance content, um, please feel free to reach out to our work group leaders. I think they had provided their contact information or you can also reach out to your um, BDH uh, technical assistance team for your region. Um, I want to uh, express my sincere thanks and appreciation to our work group leads, um, the health department staff at NASDAQ and CSTE who contributed to the development of this document. Um, uh, and uh, as always, um, thank you all for your time and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.